our hymn books and turn to hymn number 441, Sunlight. We need that. We'll sing the first and second verse of hymn number 441. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me, and with the sunlight of his love bid all my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight, in my soul today. Is it spring yet? Oh, I was just checking, just making sure. All right. We need songs like that one more often. Amen. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. We need a little bit of that, and we can have that in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for coming. Thank you for, thank you for your faithfulness, being here in our midweek service, and also those watching online. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your, for your presence and your hand upon this service lord we know that without you uh, lord it's all in vain and uh, lord it's a wonderful thing to come to your house but it's even better when you're home and i pray father that you will be in the midst of us and and lord be with those that are here in person be with those that are watching we pray for all of our uh, different departments tonight the the kids for christ the teens the adults lead us and guide us in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. All right, your midweek announcements are as follows. Soul winning opportunities. Yes, we have our regular organized soul winning at 10 a.m. on Saturdays and 3 p.m. on Sundays. Next, we have our adult Valentine's activity. All adults are invited to the Valentine's activity on Sunday, or Saturday, February 13th at 6 p.m. We'll have a fun night of games and fellowship. Uh, we will be playing a murder mystery game. The cost is free since there will be no food. College concert, the Fairhaven Baptist College Instrumental Ensemble, uh, will be here uh, with us on Sunday, February the 14th. Don't miss this uplifting music. And upcoming missionary guests, Sunday night, February 21st, missionary Josh Schwarga and his wife will be with us presenting their, their burden to New Zealand. Don't miss it. Sounds like an exciting missions trip in the future. How about that? Right. Let me add a couple things. Uh, first of all, I want to encourage everyone to get on the website, get on the Grace Baptist Church of Lockport website, and take a good look at the calendar for 2021. We went over that a little bit in our meeting uh, Sunday night, our members meeting, but it is for everyone to have access to. So instead of passing out papers this year or some kind of a handheld calendar we've got it well we actually gave a sheet I guess in the uh, bulletin uh, slip one in last Sunday but uh, for everybody all you have to do is get on the website and you can follow along all year long the different well, all the main activities uh, not every single uh, thing is mentioned in, in on the calendar on the website but all of the main things and the big ones so uh, please make sure that you uh, you know get that etched in your mind and and uh, Make sure you reserve those dates and, the, the, and, and put them on your calendar. And uh, so I encourage you to do that. The New Baptist Bread is in uh, the March and April edition. And these are located on the little tables in the foyer. So if you uh, use the Baptist Bread and you'd like to take one, they are in. Just got in, I think, yesterday. So I uh, wanted to announce that. And also we mentioned in our members meeting that we were taking up an offering uh, for one of our college girls and uh, who is uh, uh, trying to find work and has not been able to find it yet so we want to keep her in school so several have donated that and if you'd like to donate to uh, the Catherine Grossi fund uh, then let Miss Mandy know and uh, and she'll help you with that 
All right, let's take our songbooks, turn to page number 387. While you're doing that, is there anyone first time tonight? First time visitor? All right, everyone is uh, regular folk. Let's all stand 387. 387, we'll sing that first and second verse of 387. <laughs> For Christ, then head on to the next room. Walk, please. Everyone walking, and teens can be dismissed as well to the team room. Teen room up in the front for your area. All right, adults will be getting your prayer sheets out, and uh, brother um, brother Charlie's gonna go ahead and uh, lead you in the prayer time, and I'm gonna be speaking to the boys and girls in the Kids for Christ. And I'll be back in just a few minutes for our uh, lesson tonight. Pastor, just to go over the prayer request with you again. I, I like that last song, Yield Not to Temptation. If you look at that second verse I was telling Pastor, that's what we did as a young person. Back when, you know, Doc was a young person, that was very important, that second verse. You know, if you look at the word, shun evil companions, bad language disdain, God's name hold in reverence. You don't see that anymore. Nor take it in vain. Be thoughtful and earnest, kind-hearted and true. You don't see that anymore. Uh, young people today, the, it's tough to find somebody who will be kind-hearted to, especially an adult. I see it on a daily basis where I... I work, um, uh, they just, you know, I'm not going to preach, but I've seen the decline over the years of young people, you know, how that does not apply to them now. And it's really sad. But anyway, I digress. I, I showed that to Pastor. I said, we forgot about that verse. But anyway, prayer request. Now, if something needs to be updated, just speak up. Uh, baby Soren, congenital diaphragm, uh, a uh, hernia, strength and salvation for the parents. Rose Borgers, cancer. Sandy Brow, stage four cancer. Rick Castell, uh, stage four cancer. Jeremy Cox, Crohn's. Linda Yates, better health, fell and hurt her side and feet. Uh, Alan Johnson, salvation for Karen. Dan, Bob, Andy, Wally, and George Jacob. Uh, Marilyn for cancer. Bob Snyder, uh, Barb Snyder, who's not here tonight. Arthritis pain. Sherera. Uh, Robinette, stage four breast cancer. Sharon Ledvina, better health and strength and salvation. Clark Rushing, salvation and depression. Tony Lulo, uh, arthritis in his hand. It's good to see Tony back. Uh, Cheryl O'Leary's parents, better health. Bill Cartwright, unspoken for a friend. Uh, Marcia, Marlene uh, Cartwright's sister, breathing problems. Dominic Segretti, physical therapy for his feet. Michael Reed, employment, Shalene, bone marrow cancer, Jessica Dabrowski, your son Seth, Miriam Bolton, nephew Jacob, spiritual need, Will Gennard, spiritual prayer for Tyler, Dave Dolneck, good results from uh, the heart monitor, 
Ka uh, Catherine Grossi needs a job. Zach Zagretti, uh, new employment opportunity. Uh, Mary Rushing needs hip surgery. Okay. Okay. So she has an appointment tomorrow? Okay. See the doctor. So that's Mary Rushing. Amy Kono, waiting for referral to see a surgeon. Michelle Hawkins, lung cancer. Donna Parker, CAT scan. Bill Niehaus, uh, leak in the heart valve. And Tiffany just had a baby and is not doing well. Jeff Milkey, scarring on lungs from COVID. David uh, Lonchik. David? Okay. Um, yeah, he's the second one down there. I, I want to say Amon. Amon? Okay, so take Amon off. But he, so, okay. Um, do you want to take him off? I'll leave him on. Yeah, so Amon, uh, leave him on for he needs a new kidney. And then Linda Dennis, unspoken. Uh, Bonnie Niehaus fell and broke her hand. Uh, Cheryl Canelli, vertigo. Uh, the Burlingham family, uh, comfort on the passing of their loved one. Emma, what? Emma? Oh, Burlingham. Okay, so take them off, the comfort of the uh, losing of their loved one. And then Emma Brisbane's uh, grandparents, both of them have COVID. Karen Smith in hospital in critical condition with uh, pneumonia. And then Scott with surgery. Anything that needs to be changed there in any of those. Okay. And then we have new requests, Mary Waddell. This is a new one. Uh, Marietta Martinez, blockage in artery in the neck for successful treatment. That's Mary Waddell or um, her friend Marietta Martinez for a blockage in the artery in her neck. And then the Pradells, uh, Andrea Bilquis for kidney infection to go away. Do we know, do I know Andrea? <laughs> it's Kyle's wife, okay. So this is Kyle Bilquis's wife, Andrea, for kidney infection to go away. So that's a new one too. And then Gerlinda, travel mercies for Hunter and Mary as they travel to her parents' house and then back to Elgin this weekend. Well, I hope it's a, a great trip. Mary is a wonderful girl. Any other new requests before we go to prayer? I think uh, with Pastor being in there, I never know how long he's going to speak. Um, but uh, let's take a few minutes just to uh, uh, pray over these, and then uh, when he comes in, I'll get up, I'll say a quick prayer, and then we'll begin uh, our uh, sermon tonight.
heaven, I thank you for this night, Lord. I thank you for all that's shown up tonight, Lord. I, I know this is the core of our church. I know these people pray for these requests, and Lord, I pray that you would answer accordingly. Sometimes we've got to go into the valley to understand your will, but Lord, I pray that you give us victories each and every day, Lord, and Lord, may we be a testimony to those out in this world. And Lord, we touch people, whether we believe it or not, uh, each and every day with our words, with our actions, uh, even with our looks toward people. And Lord, I just, uh, I'm thankful for these uh, young, young people that Pastor is teaching right now, Lord. May they absorb it. May they uh, take it within themselves. And uh, Lord, may it resonate uh, in their own minds and their hearts that uh, they need to be like Christ. But uh, just as uh, the Apostle Paul, before he became the Apostle Paul, Lord, uh, the two questions that Apostle Paul asked is like, who are you, Lord? I pray these young people would find out who he is and then that, Lord, that you would show them what uh, they need to do. Lord, I just, I think of uh, one young girl in that group who uh, came up to me and says, I know exactly what I want to do with my life. And uh, it was just encouraging to me. And I think of the teens with Abe and Mandy. I, I think of uh, how they're right on the edge of uh, going into adulthood. Lord, there's so many things that are going to come their way. Lord, may they cast all their care upon you for uh, the Bible says clearly that you care for them. And Lord, may they make the right decisions. Just in that uh, uh, song that we just sang, Lord, may they uh, um, abstain from all appearance of evil. It's it's a difficult thing in this world. It's a wicked world right now, and so it's filled with a lot of uh, disappointment and hate. Lord, we just pray that, uh, as the Bible says, that you would have those who are hateful, you would have them in derision, and Lord, that uh, you would uh, inject yourself in, into the conversation. And so we pray for our, uh, our government leaders, whether it's state, local, or federal, Lord, uh, they need uh, your intervention uh, in their minds, in their hearts, in their lives. So we pray that uh, uh, you would uh, do accordingly. And Lord, I just thank you for this uh, night when we have the opportunity to study the book of Revelation. The book says clearly that uh, blessed are those who read this. And uh, Lord, we don't need to be afraid of the future because we know what the future is going to bring to us someday. And so, Lord, may we be uh, soldiers of the cross. May we always be ready to give an answer to the hope that's in us. Lord, there's uh, uh, things that are going to come our way that uh, uh, I can think of some folks that are just sitting right here that uh, they didn't think that what was going to happen in their life was going to come their way. But, Lord, may uh, you keep them steadfast in their faith. May they not waver. May they stay strong. Uh, as we see so many who, uh, through this whole coronavirus uh, and COVID issue, Lord, uh, they've fallen away. And Lord, we need to see them get back in your church. And Lord, be strengthened, strengthened by your word, but strengthened by your people. So I thank, thank you for this time, Lord. May we learn something from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and take our Bibles and turn to Revelation. And I'm excited tonight about the chapter that we're going to study. Revelation chapter 19. What a blessing this is. And uh, I'll go ahead and move it to the side. Maybe I'm up. Loud enough because I'm not going to be shouting, I don't think. <laughs> Unless I get real excited. I might get excited. But uh, yes. No, we don't have lessons to pass out, no. Nope, we have our Bibles and we have this. Uh, I put a lot of work into this and uh, uh, so that I won't have to pass out a sheet. And you can see it all up here on the screen. You can take your own notes, but the uh, main thing is have your Bibles open and uh, the screen will also be a big help to you. I enjoyed uh, speaking to the boys and girls and I uh, just, every one of them are so precious and uh, we do not take lightly uh, the importance of teaching and investing into the um, boys and girls and the young people in our church. And I, I have such a heart for these kids. I, I love them. And, 
and I want the best for them. And parents, thank you for entrusting your children uh, with uh, uh, us here at Grace Baptist Church, the leadership and the teachers. And we have some really, really uh, good teachers that love uh, to invest in boys and girls and teens as well. All right, let's look at uh, chapter 19, if you will, Revelation chapter 19. If you're watching at home, I encourage you to open your Bible as well. And uh, we're going to stay right here in Revelation 19. And uh, Revelation uh, chapter 19, of course, this, is, uh, this brings the book of Revelation to a climax. The return of Christ to establish His millennial kingdom his literal second coming. I want us to look at verses 1 through 6. And it says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. I don't think, Ryan, I had my, um, the clicker. So I'm going to need that. And uh, so we can... Um, Move along on the slides, and let's go to verse 2. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication. I'll explain what that means in just a little bit. And hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God, that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And so... We need to go back a little bit here. There we go. All right, so the first section of chapter 19, I entitle it, Praise in Heaven. These first six verses that we just read, uh, where is this uh, happening? Uh, think about this uh, as the scene, scene one in chapter 19. It's all happening in heaven. So what you see in those six verses uh, people are praising God and, and saying hallelujah and glory to God and they're praising Him for what He is about to do on earth. So these uh, verses show heaven's response to the judgment of the harlot. Now the, uh, the uh, multitude in heaven, they are praising God for what? For judging the great whore. Now it uses the, the, the word uh, in uh, verse number, uh, I think it was verse number 3. I believe, no, it was verse 2. It says, for he hath judged the great whore. Now you say, what is that talking about? Well, the great whore refers to Babylon. It refers to uh, the two Babylons that we find in Revelation chapter 17 and Revelation chapter 18. Now in Revelation chapter 8 or 17, we saw the fall of religious Babylon. Remember that? There's going to be a one world religion that's going to dominate the entire world. That system will fall. And who is the leader of that one world religion? Who can raise their hand and tell me? Yes, Vernita. Who? Well, Satan ultimately, but there was a, a human figure, John. The false prophet. The false prophet is the, the, the religious leader of this one world system, religious system, that will be uh, under the Antichrist, under the beast, and of course under Satan. But this one world religion will fall, and it's uh, the... the um, uh, the, f the description of its fall is found in chapter 17. Uh, that religion is called the great whore, the whore of Babylon. Uh, in chapter 18, we see Babylon or political Babylon fell. Remember that? Chapter 18. So the 
one world government, and there'll be a one world government, uh, a, a system, a one, one economic system, and uh, that will fall. That falls in chapter 18. So this is all, this is heaven praising God for the fall of the great whore, which represents the spiritual Babylon in the latter days. The religious system will fall, and the political system will fall, along with the economic system. So that's what that means here when it mentions the great whore. And it talks about avenging the blood of the martyrs. Many will be martyred. Many Christians, their lives will be uh, snuffed out. They will be uh, killed, murdered, martyred by the Antichrist and his authorities. Uh, and um, so they will, they're praising God for avenging that. The word hallelujah in these passages is the Greek equivalent of hallelujah and means praise Yahweh or simply praise the Lord. The eternal smoke that we see in this passage here in heaven symbolizes the permanence of Babylon's destruction. Smoke means it's, our, it's been burnt up. It's done, it's been destroyed, and that's what the, the smoke tells us. Uh, the, uh, the word amen, it derives from a Hebrew word meaning to be firm and may be translated truly or so be it. When a person says amen, a sincere amen, you're simply saying so be it or I believe, you know. Uh, God's will be done. You know? And uh, so these are the first six verses. Praise in heaven. A multitude in heaven praising God for what He's done and for what He's about to do. All right, that brings us now to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, how, I'm sure all of us I'm, I'm, sure that, I'm sure there's a, uh, that, that would be all. I don't think anybody in here has not been to a wedding reception. Has anyone not been to a wedding reception? Uh, as far as I know, everyone has been to one. And uh, this is going to be the, the marriage supper of all marriage suppers. I think about the best recept, wedding reception you ever went to and uh, uh, the biggest spread, you know, or, or, or whatever. This is going to top them all. We are going to have a marriage, a marriage ceremony, a marriage supper, a marriage feast in heaven. And I believe this takes place after the rapture. It takes place during the tribulation. While the tribulation is going on down on earth, we will be in heaven enjoying the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's go ahead and look at these verses. And they are found in Revelation 19, verses 7 uh, through verse 10. Look at that with me. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the lin fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So, verses 7 through 10, we see the marriage supper of the Lamb. And let's uh, go ahead and uh, here's a, a, a depiction. Think about a table that goes on and on and on and on. And uh, let me tell you who's going to be at this marriage supper. And, uh, but let's look at 2 Corinthians 11.2. The Apostle Paul wrote this, and he was referring to the church. By the way, the church is the bride. You and I, we, uh, we are part of the church. If, uh, if a person is saved during the church age, that person becomes a part of the bride of Christ. You and I are the bride. We are the bride. 
we're the ones that's going to get married to Jesus. Paul said this, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you, or given you to marriage, to one husband, and that's Jesus, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Those are Paul's words from the Holy Spirit of God, talking about how the church is the bride, and the church is espoused uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's give you some teaching here on this marriage supper, what it means, and so pay close attention, and if you're at home, I hope that this is centered in here, you can see this well. But the, uh, this uh, marriage, or marriage supper, parallels the typical Jewish marriage and the Jewish feast that uh, was found uh, during Old Testament times and even New Testament times. The Jewish marriage consisted of three main elements. Number one, the engagement or the betrothal. Now, uh, we do the same thing in our Western culture. In our Western culture, for the most part, people get engaged first. You know, uh, a guy pops the question, she says yes or no. If she says yes, then they're engaged. And, uh, and so that's uh, an engagement period. The Jews also practiced an engagement period. Uh, the, in Jewish custom, it usually lasted about a year. It was kind of a, it was, it was pretty much set that an engagement or a betrothal would be one year. And uh, this was a time for them to get to know each other and so forth. Now, they, they would not live together in, as a husband and wife would. They would not consummate their marriage physically. But they would be a year of engagement, of being espoused. It's like when the Bible says that Mary and Joseph, remember it says that uh, Mary was espoused to Joseph. Remember that? And then she was engaged to be married to Joseph. Uh, but uh, so the first uh, element is the engagement or the betrothal. And uh, when, when is that taking place? When we, when we uh, take this and put it in the chronological order of prophecy. Well, it's the church age. Right now, we are in the engagement period right now. We haven't officially gotten married to Jesus yet. The church, us, the bride. Now, uh, the moment you got saved, the moment you were born again, Charlie, the moment that you said, I do to Jesus, or accepted Him as your Savior, you were a spouse to Him. Now, the ceremony hasn't happened yet. The supper hasn't happened yet. The reception hasn't happened yet, but it's just as good as done the moment we accepted Christ into our heart. Amen? But right now, we are all engaged uh, in that betrothal period, and that's the church age, okay? Uh, and this engagement period, or betrothal, will end when the rapture takes place. When the rapture takes us up, because during... Uh, uh, Jewish uh, customs uh, was that the bride would actually go to the house of the bride and literally take her and get her. So you read some of the parables of Jesus when he talked about the uh, the uh, remember the, the brides uh, when he talked about the uh, uh, the bridesmaids and so forth and the parable of of uh, where where they had the lamps and and uh, some of them filled their lamps with oil some of them didn't. And it talks about how, uh, behold, the bridegroom cometh. And he would come usually around midnight. And uh, so in Jewish custom, the bridegroom would go and get the bride and bring her to the ceremony, bring her to the place where they would actually get married. Uh, we are in the engagement period. But when the rapture comes, the Lord comes and gets us. He's going to take us up out of this earth. He's coming to get his bride. Amen? And we're going to go up and uh, go up with him. And the second uh, element is the marriage ceremony and wedding feast. Now that will happen after the rapture in heaven. And that's what these passages describe. It's an actual ceremony, wedding feast. We're going to feast. It's going to be a, 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 just an amazing, wonderful party and uh, a feasting. And uh, that will take place uh, uh, after the rapture in heaven. 
And then the third element is the honeymoon. You know, you got your engagement, you got your, your wedding, and then your feast. And then the bride and groom go on a honeymoon. Uh, that was also customary for the, uh, for the Jews. Now, uh, from what I read in commentaries that I've read and studies that I've done on Jewish customs, especially in the Old Testament and even the New Testament, is they would take another year. Uh, uh, they would take a, a year off for a honeymoon. And <laughs> I know it sounds great, doesn't it? But they would. They would designate a year. And uh, so this would be the uh, honeymoon. Now, when does the honeymoon happen when it comes to Jesus and his church and his bride? Well, the millennium. When Jesus comes back again, that's what we're going to see right here in chapter 19 tonight. But when Jesus comes back Physically, literally, we come back with him. His bride's going to be with him. And we're going to go through a thousand-year honeymoon. <laughs> That's better than a year, amen? Through a thousand years, it's going to be the millennium, the millennial kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Christ. So there's your three elements, your engagement, church age. We're going through that now. And then there'll be the marriage ceremony and the wedding feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb. That'll be after the rapture in heaven, during the tribulation. Then you have the honeymoon. That's the millennial kingdom when the Lord comes back and establishes that. All right, Revelation 22, 8. Watch this. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Uh, here we see that John is... Uh, uh, actually falls down at the angel's feet. He's so enraptured. He is so overwhelmed by everything that he's seeing. Remember now, he's seeing all this. He's not just hearing it and writing it down. He is seeing it in a vision. And so he falls down in front of this angel and uh, tries to worship this angel. And the angel says, Get up, John. Hey, I'm a servant just like you. Worship God. Amen? By the way, we should never put man on a pedestal. Amen? Man should never be worshipped. Angels should never be worshipped. The only one worthy of our worship is the Lord. And uh, so, uh, that, so we, we see these different uh, symbolisms in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, before we get to uh, the second coming, I want to say a couple more things about the marriage supper. And that is, it says that the bride was arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. What does that represent? The wedding dress. Okay? That's the wedding garment. And uh, that is a picture of the righteousness of the church. Now, what righteousness do you and I have before God? We have Christ's righteousness. Amen? Listen, we're not righteous in ourselves. Amen? We live in a self-righteous generation. People thinking they're better than other people. Judge people all the time. Condemning people all the time. You're, I'm right and you're wrong. I'm good and you're evil. Self-righteous generation. We're seeing it on the television. We're seeing it in the news. We see it in the politics. We see it in, the, in, in, in social agendas. And People are so self-righteous. Well, I'm... I'm right and you're wrong and I'm better and you And listen, the only righteousness you and I have is the righteousness that we get when we get saved. And that comes from the Lord Jesus. His righteousness is now our righteousness. Amen? So that, uh, that, that, that garment that is white, it represents the righteousness of Christ. Now in verses 11 through 16, here we go. Fasten your seatbelts. Because Jesus is coming again. And he is coming literally this time. And physically, he's going to come all the way down to the earth. And we find this in verses 11 through 16. Let's read these rejoicing as we read them. It says, And I saw heaven opened. Behold, a white horse... And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Remember back in Revelation uh, chapter 6? Remember the, the seven seals? Remember the four horses? 
What color was the first horse? It was white. But it wasn't Jesus on that horse. It was the Antichrist. Remember that? He comes galloping in at the beginning of the tribulation on a white horse. Remember, everything the Antichrist does is going to be a copy of Jesus. See, he's a counterfeit. He's a counterfeit. This time, the real Savior comes on a white horse. Amen? So it says he's coming on a white horse. Look at verse 11. And uh, he's called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. You see that? Judge and make war. He is the judge of all the universe. He will make war. Hey, the first time he came, he came as a lamb to be sacrificed. He laid down his life. The second time he comes, he's coming as a lion. The lion of Judah. The first time he came, he came humble. Boy, he was born in a manger. He was born out of a, a, a poor family. He was humble. The second time he's coming in glory, in power as the King of kings and Lord of lords. First time he came, he, he came as a, as a servant to serve people. Amen? Remember he even washed the disciples' feet? The second time he comes, he's coming to be served because he is worthy. And he's coming again. Look at verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress wine of uh, the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming again. Look at that. He's coming in power and glory. And he's coming on a white horse. And he's coming with us. I don't know if I see any of you in here, but uh, he, we are there. Maybe not in this picture, but we're coming back. And uh, let me give you the description of Christ. The description we see that we just read, here it is. This is what he's coming like. He's not coming as a lowly lamb. Uh, he's coming in victory. His eyes, it says his eyes are a flame of fire when he comes back. What does that mean? It talks of his glory and his judgment. It says his head, on his head are many crowns. Why? Because it refers to his sovereignty and authority. He's come, he didn't come to serve. He's not coming to serve next time. He's coming to reign. Amen. And then it says his name is one that no one knew but he himself. It's the mystery and the greatness of his presence. And then his clothes. It talks about the clothes he wears. It'll be a robe dipped in the blood of his enemies. And then his name is the Word of God. And his armies, who are his armies? Well, the Bible says his armies are the saints and angels. Well, how do we know this? Well, we go to Zechariah chapter 14, verse 5. Look at this. This is a prophecy about his second coming. It says, And the Lord my God shall come, and all the what with the saints. That's us. We're the saints. And then Matthew 25, 31 says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy, what? Angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. So He's coming back again. His armies will consist of the saints, us, and the angels in heaven. His mouth is described, a sharp sword. That means judgment through His spoken word. He's going to, it just, just by his word, he's going to, you know, maybe he just shouts and his enemies are destroyed and obliterated. 
but a, a sharp sword, judgment, his spoken word, his title. He has a title. On his robe is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. When he laid down his life the first time he came on that old rugged wooden cross. Remember Pilate put that sign up on the top of the cross in, in three different languages. And it said, Jesus, it said, King of the Jews. Remember that? King of the Jews. Well, that's what man put up there. This time he himself is coming back with the words written on his robe, King of kings and Lord of lords. And no one will be able to dispute it. No one will be able to, uh, to say that he is not that. And uh, so that is the second coming. The glorious second coming. He comes back. Uh, I could give you a lot more details. We could see hundreds of scriptures. Uh, even throughout the Old Testament, it talks about his second coming. He is going to go through the eastern gate of Jerusalem, bust through that thing. His feet, his foot is going to touch the Mount of Olives. It's going to split in two. I heard a geologist uh, a few years back saying that the mountain, they've tested it, it's already starting to crack. Well, uh, I don't need that to prove that Jesus is going to split it, but it is interesting if it is starting to crack because when, as soon as his foot touches it, it's going to split in two. Amen? And uh, he's coming back on a white horse, and when he comes back in the clouds, there's going to be armies awaiting him. The Antichrist is going to know that Jesus is coming back. Satan knows it. The Antichrist will know it. False prophet will know it. And they're going to gather the armies of the world to try to fight against Jesus when he comes back. You know the way things are going in the world right now? It doesn't surprise me that people think that they're going to defeat Jesus. You know, the arrogancy of people today, the pride people have today, the self-righteousness, the shake-the-fist-at-God attitude people have today. I mean, it's no wonder they're going to be waiting in that valley. We'll get to that right now. Time's running out on us. The last part of chapter 19 is the battle of Armageddon. When Jesus comes back down, he immediately engages in this battle. And we find it in verses 17 through 21. Look at verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great, uh, the great Lamb, of the great God. So the first thing we see is that an angel prepares the cleanup crew. <laughs> Who's the cleanup crew going to be, uh, Brother Tony? It's going to be all the birds. So the angel saying to all the birds, the vultures and the, and, and, and the, uh, the condors and the blackbirds and the ravens and all the birds of the world, gather together, birds, because you're going to be the cleanup crew. Because there's going to be one big mess after Jesus gets done with his enemies. And the birds are going to literally eat the flesh of all these dead bodies in this valley. And he goes on and says in verse 18, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. So this supper is quite the contrast to the marriage supper of the Lamb that we just saw in heaven. This is going to be a different kind of supper. This is the supper that will happen on earth uh, at the end of this battle. Look at verse 19. And I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth, those that are under him, and their armies gathered together to make war against him, Jesus, that sat on the horse, and against his army, us. And the beast was taken, the Antichrist, and with him the false prophet, that religious, one world religious leader, that wrought miracles before him. And with, 
uh, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of burning, of a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword, whatever that sword is, proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So here in verses 19 through 21, we see that the armies of the beast, the Antichrist, the kings of the east and of all the earth will gather in Palestine at Armageddon. Look at, uh, uh, we go, I want you to go back to uh, chapter 16 quickly with me. Go to Revelation 16. Remember we saw a glimpse of this battle earlier when we were studying uh, chapter 16? Chapter 16, verse 14, for they are the spirits of devils. Uh, it says, working uh, miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. It's the devils and the demons themselves are going to gather those armies in that valley to try to go up against the Lord uh, and Savior Jesus. And, uh, and so, uh, go back to chapter 19. And so they will gather, they will gather to try to prevent the return and the kingdom of Christ. Can you imagine that? Christ will immediately defeat and capture Antichrist and the false pro prophet, and they both will be cast alive into the lake of fire, wherever the lake of fire is. I cannot tell you where it's at. I don't know where it's at. But wherever it's at, they're going to be cast into it. And uh, they will become the first inhabitants of this eternal place of punishment. We're going to see more of the lake of fire in the next chapter. The rest of the kings and the armies will be defeated destroyed and eaten by the birds. The unbelieving survivors, and there will be unbelieving survivors, they, uh, they will be judged by Christ and sentenced to everlasting fire. In uh, Matthew chapter 25, we see this. In, um, I don't have that here, but in Matthew 25 and verses 41... And of course, this passage and others talk about how the Lord's going to separate the sheep from the goats when He comes back. He's going to separate the wheat from the tares when He comes back. So there's going to be saved people that are going to survive all of this, this whole tribulation. Many saved people will be martyred, but there will be saved people that will survive it. There will be unsaved people, probably not a whole lot of them, but some that will survive it. Maybe they're hiding out or whatever. Jesus will find them. He will separate the goats from the sheep. He will separate the wheat from the tares. Because the time I'll have, you can read Matthew 25 when you get a chance. The word Armageddon is a word that means and describes Mount Megiddo, which is an actual place in Israel. It is located in the valley of Jezreel. Look at the map here. and it, I'll get my pointer out here. Uh, I'm pointing right now towards, um, this is Joppa, this is all Israel right here, okay, um, let me see, this is Bethlehem, and Jerusalem's right here, so Jerusalem is down here, I'll circle it, that's Jerusalem, so up north, northern part of Israel, up actually before you get to Galilee, which is where Jesus was raised, this is the valley called Jezreel. Mount Megiddo is in there. This is the valley where all the armies of the world, the Antichrist, will gather together to actually try to fight against Jesus. And uh, here's a picture of the valley. It is miles and miles and miles of openness. A lot of it's farmland, as you can see. So a lot of it has been cultivated. But it is literally, it is... a. Uh, I don't know if it was Napoleon or if it was Patton or somebody, some famous general actually went to this valley and he looked out and he said, this would be the perfect battlefield. He said, I've never seen a more perfect battlefield than this valley. It could literally fit the armies of the world. 
Remember the Euphrates River is going to dry up. And that's going to enable the armies from the east, China, to come over and attack Israel and also the Lord Jesus when he comes back. It's not going to last long, this battle. <laughs> it's going to be very lopsided, <laughs> very one-sided. I mean, Jesus come back and it's going to destroy the armies. The wicked armies of the Antichrist and the end times. And there it is. Has anyone been to the Holy Land? Charlie, have you? Did you see this? Yeah, it's huge. It's huge, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's an estimation, about 200 million. Yeah, maybe more, probably more than that. Yeah, probably quite a bit more than that. He's coming again, folks. Let me end with this. Hang in there for a minute. Let me say four things and I'm done. Number one, we have a glorious future ahead of us. Amen? Marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, rapture. Glory to God. Marriage supper of the Lamb. Coming back with Him. The millennial kingdom. Next, Jesus is coming again. Keep, keep reminding yourself, Jesus is coming again. And he comes in two parts. Part one, the rapture, comes for his bride. Part two, comes back with his bride. Saints and angels, comes back literally, physically to the earth. Are you ready? Are you ready? I, I, I hope and, and trust that you have received Christ as your Savior and that you are ready if the rapture were to take place tonight, that you are part of the bride and that he's coming to get you. And if you're saved, he is. Amen. That's wonderful. I don't know what I would do right now in this whole world if I was not saved. Lastly, are your loved ones and friends ready? I know they have to make their own decision. But are you praying for them? Are you being an example to them, a witness? Jesus is coming again. Heavenly Father, what a glorious chapter this is. The culmination, the climax of the book of Revelation. There's more yet, more wonderful things yet, but Lord, this is the climax. Your coming, your victory over the Antichrist and the armies of the world. And Father, we just thank you for your plan, for your will. We thank you, Father, that we're in your hands. Meanwhile, Lord, help us to be a, a, a witness and a testimony to those that do not know you. May we be ready. May our lamps be filled with the oil that we need every day to serve you and live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple things before we're dismissed. If, um, don't forget the uh, Valentine activity, if you can be here for that, Saturday at uh, 6 p.m. Then let's be faithful in our Sunday school class this uh, Sunday and Sunday morning. Sunday night, we have the Fairhaven Musical Group going to be with us. That'll be a blessing as well. God bless you, and uh, stay warm and safe, and amen. Bernita, did you go to uh, Arizona already? No, I just Oh, okay, I thought you'd left me and come back.